demo. This is Ben. Get that. Said hi. <laughs> yeah, I jumped the gun a bit. But that's, that's all good. That's fine. You're doing well. My name's Joel. Uh, I spend most of the stream working behind the camera and the computer running things. Uh, but we're not here for me. We're here to watch this guy brew some beer. Uh, so what are you brewing today, Ben? Uh, so we are doing Munich Hellas, which is probably my favourite style of beer. Um, but it's also, I think, a really good showcase of the, um, of the Braumeister's kind of programmable capabilities. Because um, we can really easily do multiple stepped mashes and all those crazy German things without really having to do much other than push a few buttons and, uh, and the machine does the work for us. So I think, I think it's a really good kind of showcase of, of, um, of what these things can do, so yeah. Yeah, it's a challenging beer to brew, but rewarding. Can be. Yeah. Can be. Yeah, sure. Um, it, just on a, on a quick note, hope, every, hope everyone is safe and well out there. Uh, you'll notice we're all masked up, uh, things in Victoria. Just so we can't get doxxed. Just, yeah, yeah, that's mostly why. Uh, but uh, the other reason is because we are amidst some stage four restrictions here in uh, Victoria, especially Melbourne at the moment where we are recording from. Uh, so for those of you watching interstate or around the world, um, I mean, we're all facing our own challenges at the moment, but we're doing our bit to uh, uh, stay safe. And um, uh, yeah, we hope everyone out there is doing well. Ben will be wearing a mask for the entirety of the um, the demo, so just know that he is smiling under there. Um, uh, I think we're in a world now. We're mouthing a whole bunch of swear words at you. <laughs> just even quietly. Though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think that's enough for me. I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to leave you in this guy's very capable hands. For years. Right. Um, so yeah. So straight off the gate, I'm just going to quickly set up the. Just going to quickly switch on the program so that we can get the water heated to where we want it to be. Um, what I'm also going to do, I've got some brewing salts here. Um, so with Munich Hellas, you want it to be fairly soft water. So I haven't gone too overboard with it, but just enough to get a bit of calcium in there to help the enzymes um, that are in the grains do their thing as the mash progresses. Um, but I'm just going to add a little bit of my water uh, into my salts just to get them dissolved. Um, and then, then I'll add them into the, um, into the brewing water um, and that will just help them to mix a little bit better. If I just put them in, you can just put them in as salts, um, but I just find by like dissolving them even just a little bit in some water, um, it just kind of helps them um, incorporate a little bit better, a little bit quicker. So I'll just quickly chuck them in. Uh. And now my water's good to go. So I've basically just done two and a half grams each of calcium chloride and calcium sulfate. Um, chloride gives you richness and kind of malt expression um, and sulfate gives you kind of sharpness and definition. Um, again, I don't want to go too crazy with um, the minerals for this beer and I definitely don't want it to come across as harsh. Um, Municalis should have a nice sort of soft, rounded feel to it. Um, and the bitterness should be present, but not too assertive. So um, keeping it fairly balanced with the mineral additions is going to help me achieve that. I don't want overboard sulfates to kind of really add harshness and, and sort of make it too sharp with the bitterness um, because you do want a nice soft mouth. Or even though it, it should finish really dry, this style of beer, um, you don't want it to be dry and sharp. Yeah, it's not like a pilsner where you want to accentuate that top bite. Yeah, it, yeah it's a really malt driven beer, so you want it, but you still want it to be dry. Like it, yeah. it, the best way to think about most Bavarian beer, but Hellas in particular, is that the correct way to drink it is by the litre, um, particularly in a hot beer garden in Bavaria in yeah, the middle of summer. That's, it, that's, it, that's doing it right. Um, so if you can't drink a litre of it and still be thirsty for a second litre, yeah. um, then you've gone wrong somewhere. Um, it needs to be extremely drinkable, extremely dry, but still flavourful and soft. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what separates it from, say, like a Bitburger or like a, um, like a, a German Pils, which is a lot sharper. 
um, and more pronounced bitterness. This is a lot softer, but still got that dryness to it. Mm. So um, I think you need a bit of sulfate to hit that dryness, um, but I wanted it to be relatively balanced. So it's, it's one-to-one -one chloride disulfate. Um, in terms of parts per million, again, you want a slightly softer water profile. So I haven't gone overboard with the salt additions. Um, I've, I've sort of hit about 50 ppm of calcium, um, which is what they sort of recommend, what they, mm -hmm. they, they yeah, the royal recommend they. As, as your kind of standard minimum calcium um, content in your water to sort of help with enzymes and, and all that stuff. Um, but I've deliberately tried not to go over that. So um, again, because I want that softness. I want, I want um, it's sort of, in terms of mouthfeel and malt character, you're kind of in bohemian, like Czech pills territory for that, but with a less pronounced and less kind of floral hop character. Yeah, is, I, is a good way to think of Hellas. Uh, and now we just wait for the Braumeister to hit temperature, which it just did. We're, um, we're gonna add our grains in, which is very exciting. I'm going to use my fingers to rip the bag open, or tear it asunder, if you will. Um, which leaves, I just find it leaves a nice jagged, uneven hole and makes the grains fall out in an awkward, in an awkward way. Um, but while I'm adding this in, I will say that I'm putting the grain in at 35 degrees, which might uh, be a bit surprising to a few of you. It's not a very kind of standard um, starting temperature. Yeah. But there is method to my madness. I've doed in at 35 degrees. Um, and I'm not holding it there. I'm just literally throwing the grain in there and letting it go to my first mash step, which is 52 degrees, which I will have for 10 minutes. Uh, I have 63 degrees for 30 minutes. 72 degrees for 20 minutes. And 78 degrees for 10 minutes. If I was brewing this at home, I would extend those times out. So I'd probably have um, maybe a half hour rest at 52. Um, and probably the two, the two sacrification rests are probably about right, maybe half an hour each, and then the 10 minutes at 78. Um, the reason why I've shortened them is, is so I can fit it all into a, a reasonably length demo. Um, otherwise, like I said, we'd be here all day. Not even all day, but probably longer than most people's attention span um, or significant others would allow them <laughs> to sit there and watch a brewing demonstration. Um, because there's also the heating up times between steps that I'm sort of trying to take into account. So um, if, I, if I was kind of had a 90 to 120 minute mash and then you add in the times in between, that's you know, two, two, two and a half hours just of mashing before we hit the boil. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've just kind of shrunk it down. But again, I tend to find that that works fine. I've done that a bunch of times at demos um, with different types of beer. I've done Pilsners, Hellas, um, Viennas, Mansons, all those sorts of delicious uh, European lagers. Um, and I tend to use pretty much the same mashing regime for most of my lagers. Um, and I find that it works fine. It probably is a good time to talk about what those temperatures are and why we're sort of um, honing in on those. Um, so the 35 degree dough in, which is kind of a little bit unusual. Um, some people refer to it as an acid rest. I don't really kind of buy into that. Um, it, you'd have to, for, in order for it to do what it's claimed it does, you'd have to have it there for a very long hours, time. isn't it? Like, yeah. yeah, like like talking hours to, to get that acidifying um, effect. Um, at, at which point the lactobacillus, which is already on the grain, is probably going to have more of an impact on your pH than, um, <laughs> than, yeah. uh, than the enzymes. Um, but I like to do it because it's a good hydration step. So you're kind of letting the grains get wet and hydrated and everything before any kind of real enzymatic activity starts happening. Um, so you can make sure it's all mixed in well. You can make sure that everything is sort of as it, you want it to be so that once it hits those kind of 
power temperatures we'll, we'll use as, as lack of a better word everything is kind of yeah good I, to go i like a for all my beers it's mashing in at around that temperature just makes doughing in you get don't get really get dough balls and um, yeah, I, it's just as a general thing I do. I found when I was brewing brew in a bag, um, I would kind of have a very sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, dynamic mash. Mm -hmm. So I would throw the grains in at 35 degrees with the urn still on and heating up to my sort of main sacrification yep. rest. And it would pass through all those other enzyme ranges on its way up there and I'd just be stirring constantly. Part of that is that I I'm a stirrer, I like to stir. <laughs> And um, I always, like, I knew that, like, stirring when you're in your sort of sugar mash is kind of, can be a little bit counterproductive in terms of holding on to heat. Um, but when it's heating, you need to stir. So I felt like I was doing something. And by the time I mm -hmm. hit the sack rest, I'd been stirring for so long, my wrists were sore and I didn't want to stir anything. Yeah, <laughs> so right, yeah. It kind of worked out well. But the other benefit of that was that it was going through all those um, different stages. Um, and I think the beta gluconase um, range is around the 35 to 45 degree mark. I don't know exactly where, um, but that helps to break down the kind of gumminess of the grains and, and of the um, of the wort. So, particularly when you're doing brew in a bag, and the end if you've got like a real particularly fine bag that you're using, that will help um, the sugary, delicious nectar run off a lot freer as well. Um, so that was just like, even for like a, a British Pale Ale or an American IPA or things like that, I was still doing that 35 degree dough mm. in and ramp up. Yeah. Um, because I, I was seeing better efficiency from it and I was, um, I was getting a really consistent and high quality of beer from doing that. So I, I, I just think it's a good, um, a cool thing to do. So second rest was 52 degrees. That's my protein rest. Um, there's two different temperature ranges you can do protein rests at. There's the low 50s and there's the high 50s. Um, I've actually taken now to being more inclined to go in the high 50s. Um, I, yeah, there's fairly complicated reasons behind that. And what I might even do um, is... I won't go into too much detail because I, like, I'll probably, again, not being a chemist, I'll, I'll, um, I'll get it all terribly wrong and somebody will go, oh, look at these guys, I don't know what they're talking <laughs> about. But there are reasons why um, the higher protein uh, rest is t generally favoured. The reason why I haven't gone with that one is because I wanted to really... Um, if you're in the high 50s, you're in beta amylase conversion range. Um, and I wanted to really control how long I was there for. So I've gone with the low 50s to stay a little bit more out of that range um, so that when I do hit that sort of first sacrification step, um, I'm, I'm, I'm there for sort of 30 minutes before I move on to the next step. Um, that's my thinking behind that. Um, but you could definitely do like, say, a 57 degree um, step in place of a 52 and you'd get a really good result out of that as well. You might just... Um, need slightly less time at your sort of 63 degrees. 63 degrees is actually the um, optimal temperature for beta amylase. Um, so the, the two sacrification steps I've chosen are the like absolute ultimate, like optimal temperatures for those two In enzymes. those two uh, yeah, steps. Just, just a quick question, uh, which I've seen before. The, the, that 55 degree, roughly that protein rest, is it dangerous to leave that there for too long? Is there a risk of thinning out, get winding up with a beer that's too thin at the end of the day? I have seen that. Um, so I've only done a 10 minute rest, I think. At yeah, this so my understanding is the general advice is 10, 15 minutes most, just, just for anyone out there who is wondering. Yeah. And one good thing complex. about a protein rest, if you don't have any kind of dextrinous malts or crystal malts or things, is you can sort of break down some more of those proteins um, in a way that you won't lose them from the beer. So they'll, they'll kind of stick around and won't separate out in your hot break. Um, and that can kind of help add a bit of body. Yep. Um, but it can, like Joel was saying, go the other way and make it sort of thin and insipid. So you kind of have to play it by ear mm. with, with how you go with it. Um, I think the best way to do these sorts of things is look up um, 
some different mashing regimes from trusted sort of brewers and see what they kind of talk about. So I thought, um, I did want to, um, we did actually have a question um, about why we were doing the protein rests um, and you're spot on. Um, we did actually mention at the start as well, like malt these days is really well modified. Um, so most of the proteins already been broken down, um, but I have a Brownmeister. Um, literally, it's just pushing a few extra buttons to do um, an extra set. And I'm also a massive wanker. Um, so when I'm doing like um, German style beers and it's really easy for me to do like multi-step rests, um, so multi-step mashes, um, why not? Yeah, that's my, I do that too. I have a Brownmeister as well and it's like, eh, I'll just do it because I can really. There's no, yeah, it's fun. It's, part of it's, fun. it's really good fun. Um, and, and I, you know, I, again, wanker, but <laughs> I, I do think that you get a different beer um, from doing that rather than just doing a single step match like how could you not right like the different chemical yeah, processes yeah. that have, yeah, have it, 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 happened yeah. to the beer so i don't know if the science yeah. actually backs me up in what i'm about to say so if not just laugh at me because i'm not a scientist i'm a musician <laughs> but um i personally find that doing the protein rest gives a fuller mouth feel in the end beer yeah i think it's worth doing and you know, you connected to the history of, of, of the way that the beer's been traditionally brewed as well. We've got a book here called Bavarian Hellas. And it's like that thick and it's just about this style of beer. So if you really want to get into the kind of nitty gritty of, of the style and, and the, the techniques and, and the kind of approaches to brewing it, if you read that book, you'll, you'll be brewing better Hellas than probably anybody else. <laughs> yeah, I'll post a link if anyone's interested. I'll see if I can do that. Um, and yeah, so I've kind of covered the other two steps. They're, they're just your standard um, sugar conversion steps. Um, I've gone a beta amylase rest for about half an hour and an alpha amylase for about 20 minutes-ish. Um, you could go longer, but you, I won't need it. Even though I said these malt, like this base malt was less modified, it's still fairly well modified. So it, it'll, um, we'll get full conversion by the time we hit the end of our um, the end of our mash. Um, the cool thing about Munich Hellas is it's probably the most simple recipe that you'll ever yeah. come across as well. I mean, it can get complicated. Um, some people like to, um, I'll throw that over there out of shot. Um, some people like to add other things to add character and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I personally think that I get the Munich Hellas that I like um, by more or less going 100% Pilsner malt um, and just simple noble German hops. Um, Hallertau in this case, um, I tend to alternate between Hallertau and Tetanang depending on my mood um, and depending on alpha acids and things like that. Um, if one of them is going to help me achieve what I'm trying to achieve with a single 40 gram pack better than the other, then I'll go with that. Um, but they're both amazing, gorgeous hops. And it's not a hop driven beer, but there should be a little bit of hop character in there. Um, so the hop you choose, I think is important. Do you think it's more about quality of ingredients than recipe in this case? Freshness? 100%. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's fresh, it's good quality ingredients and technique um, is what makes a good Hellas. Um, and most German beers, I would say, um, that's the case. It's about, like most, most sort of classic German beers traditionally would be one type of malt, one type of hop. Um, what makes them special is how those ingredients are treated and the freshness of those ingredients. So. Um, obviously, we don't have too much control over the freshness of our hops and our malt and things like that. Um, but we can definitely get our hands on some good quality Pilsner malt. I'm using the Wayman uh, Bohemian Pilsner uh, in this one. Um, just because it's a little bit less modified um, than some of the other ones. And I like that because I can kind of um, work, a, work, kind of have a bit more control over how the end work is. Um, I do have one other type of malt in there, which is just a sigillated malt, um, and that's basically just for pH correction. Um, because we're only using one base malt, um, the 
when you have like darker malts, crystal malts, things like that in a, in a grist, um, they have an acidifying effect on the mash. So they'll bring the pH down. Um, ideally, you want a pH of around 5.3 um, for your beers. I actually shoot lower in my German beers, so I'm shooting for about 5.1, 5.2 for this um, for this beer, and it should hit pretty much bang on. I, I might even grab the pH meter out um, once we sort of hit the um, hit the mash proper, as it were. Um, I will put the lid on while this is happening as well, just to help it kind of chug along, get to the next temperature. Um, but yeah, you want to you want to hit a pH of around 5.3. Um, ideally, I'm shooting for lower in this one just for the flavour reasons. Um, and without those darker grains, those crystal malts, things like that in the in the grist, um, if you don't do something to kind of intervene in that process, what will end up happening is your mash will be too high pH. And um, a high mash pH can result in soapy, astringent, kind of unpleasant flavours in the beer. So um, we're trying to avoid that. And that's why I've added some acidified malt, which is a German base malt, um, which has been sprayed with lactic acid. Uh, cool. Let you clean that up. Uh, what else? What else? What else is, is interesting? That's another thing. Um, if there is anybody watching this who's relatively new to brewing, um, first of all, I apologize for maybe shooting a little high. Um, we, we, are, we have sort of been tackling some kind of more advanced um, topics and ideas in this, in this video, which I, I guess was kind of, we've got a fair few um, beginner level things um, kicking around. Um, and definitely while you're on this YouTube channel as well, after this is done, um, we've got a video specifically about brewing a bag, which covers a lot of the basics of brewing. Um, so if, if you have sort of been finding that we're kind of talking another language and, and going a bit extreme with it um, in this video, um, check that one out yeah, and, and you, you'll get sort of a good catalog. grounding in the basics. I have here in my hands the BJCP style oh, guidelines. Yeah. Circa 2008 because the 2014 changes that they made I don't love. Um, but the 2008 ones, I were like what I kind of studied when I went and got my um, judging thingy, my judging accreditation, certification, whatever you want to call it. Um, and basically, when you're wanting to brew a certain style of beer, it's a really good starting point to know what you're trying to achieve. Um, from that beer. So um, over time, you'll get to know what different grains, different hops, different temperatures, like all those, all those little things that you um, incorporate into your, into your brew and into your sort of recipe design. Over time, you'll get to um, know what they do. And so when you're crafting a recipe, you can factor that in. So um, the way that they basically set it up, nine or ten different different sort of subheadings um, under the style. And if you were to enter um, your beer into a competition for judging, uh, this is what the judges will try, be trying to objectively um, comment on uh, on your beer. Um, so it's, it's always broken down to aroma, appearance, flavour, mouthfeel, and overall impression um, are you kind of your main categories. And then you'll also have your vital statistics. So like the range for your starting and finishing gravities, um, how many IBUs, the color, um, and the alcohol percentage. Um, so when you're first getting started, um, the inclination is to look at those vital statistics and say, ah, so um, starting gravity between 1045 and 1051, um, light colour, this many IBUs, so then you just throw any grains and any hop combination <laughs> into your kettle, um, which get you to those numbers and say, I made a Munich Hellas. Um, but obviously that's not going to yield you those results because there's more at play than just the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you go into the um, the categories, it gives like into those subheadings, it gives you like lots of information about 
how the beer should be. And I think the other important thing is if you're trying to sort of brew a specific style of beer is buy a few different commercial versions of it, drink them, figure out what's sort of common across them, and then jump on the net and look at a bunch of different recipes and look at what's common across them. And so when you are starting out, you can still kind of build recipes. It just takes a little bit more work of, of doing that sort of delicious research. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, like, um, like I said, looking at a few different recipes, um, preferably from trusted sources, yeah. um, to see what's common across them and, and what's likely to be the important parts because the things that differ are going to be the, the kind of less important aspects but the things that are common is going to be where you want to be focusing so yeah. I second um, that notion of try drink 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 commercial examples where you can that's that's the best one of the best ways to educate yourself on what a particular style is you know or why it is what it is and actively drink them yep. so so um, cool there's there's sitting down and smashing down a pint of it and going oh yeah but like really kind of print out a copy or like jump on the net and, and look at the look at the style guidelines while you're drinking it. And as you as you're smelling it like so like under aroma it says pleasantly grainy sweet clean pills malt aroma dominates. Low to moderately low spicy noble hop aroma and a low background note of DMS. So I'm gonna try not to have any DMS in this one. Um, it's not important. Um, but yeah so so as you're smelling that glass of Munich Hellas that you've bought, be trying to find those smells. So like that, that grainy, sweet, bready, pills kind of malt. Um, look for that, see if you can find it. Um, when you have a taste, um, slightly sweet, malty profile, um, grain and pills malt flavors, medium low hop bitterness, um, moderately low hop flavor, um, clean, no esters, no diacetyl. So again, like as you're tasting it, like look for those things that, that it's describing and you'll, you'll be able to, like when, when you read it and it gets in your head, you'll be able to notice it. And a huge part of um, actively tasting beer is building those connections between what you're smelling and tasting and the words that are associated to them. And one of the best ways to build those connections is to read what should be in the beer when you're drinking a classic version of it and then looking for those things. And then next time you're drinking a beer and you notice that, you're like, oh, that's yeah. grainy that's sweet. That's what it is. Malt. That's yes. this. That's I, um, on a per on a, just a personal story, I didn't know what the difference between a Hellas and a Pilsner was. I mean, I did on paper until we got some in at the shop and I was able to try them side by side. And they're quite different when you, you know, and, it's like, and then you just something clicks, you go, oh, that's, what it is, yeah, it's German pills, hoppy, sort of, it's got a bit of a punch to it. And yeah, the hell, it's very soft, just very drinkable. Um, it's subtle, but different. I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, and, yeah, it was and an eye opener. Th they are very similar beers, but they're also very different. And, and it's that active engagement in when you're drinking a beer, like really helps you understand that. And as a brewer, I think it's really important to be kind of actively engaging in, in those sorts of things, because that's how you develop your skills. That's how you can assess the beers that you're making and make adjustments and, and really kind of grow. Mm. And I think pursuing, like I'm very much a big advocate for brewing to style. Yes, right. Um, I think eventually like break out of that and brew whatever you want and, yeah. and it's fun and it's awesome and I love doing that too. But brewing to style gives you something to pursue. It gives you a target. Yeah, and a discipline. And a, yeah, and a discipline. And, and that target is what kind of drives you to really um, actively engage with, with um, your sensory analysis, with your recipe design, with all those different things and pushes you to, to develop and grow. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's a really, um, really useful thing. Another personal story is what I, and perhaps this is very common for new brewers. Uh, you, you, you think, oh, awesome! I can, I can be creative and make all these crazy beers that no one's ever made before. And I think I, at the time, made some beers I was quite happy with. But looking back, they were probably a little bit rubbish, to be honest. <laughs> but that's sort of just something you've got to go through. And, you, don't, you know, you don't want to... I'm not saying that anyone should limit their creativity, but there is definitely something to be said for nailing down styles and pursuing um, those pre-established 
uh, styles that are out there. You'll learn a lot more than you will, at least I did, from just sort of making stuff up as I went along and, and just, yeah. Yeah, and you've got to have fun everything. as well. But you've got to have fun. You've got to have fun. You've got to have fun and whatever works for you as a brewer that, you know, you enjoy. One of the main things that drove me to starting brewing, um, apart of, so like, one of the biggest ones was being able to drink fresh examples of a lot of beer styles that we can never drink fresh because no one brews them. Yes. Um, but one of the big driving sort of inf like influences was I had all these ideas and I thought, oh, I'm going to make all these beers that no one's ever dreamed of or drank before and it's going to innovate and make... And, and you know what? People have been brewing for 10,000 years. Everyone has, like, no matter how good your idea is, someone's done it before. Some, someone's already done it, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's not to discourage no. you from doing it no. because, like, no, like, someone might not have done it for 3,000 years, so you might be, like, really doing <laughs> something cool. Yeah. Um, but it's... I had a heap of fun doing that. Um, and every beer I had would have some wacky ingredient or like some mm, strange yeah, thing. Maybe sure, my yeah. fruit tingle this or my musk stick that or whatever yeah, the yeah, hell yeah. I was brewing. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe they just tasted good because they tasted like the thing that I was throwing at them yeah, and not yeah. like the actual um, beer itself. So uh, I think it was Riggers here actually who one day said to me, um, can you brew a Pilsner? And I was just like, I've never tried. I'm not really that excited. I was like, well, how do you know you're a good brewer then? He threw down like, the gauntlet, yeah. I don't know. And he was, he was like, if you can, when you can brew a good pilsner, then go back to your wacky, crazy things yes. and, and, and see then if they're better. Yep. Um, and that's when pursuing those styles, and particularly like the, the more challenging styles as well, becomes really, um, I think, a good thing to do um, so that you can go and develop. And then you can go back to those wacky, crazy things, but with the knowledge and the technique that you've developed through, um, through sort of honing and chasing that craft. We had a question about Australian versions of uh, Hellas, uh, which right. we talked about yeah. during the break, which uh, is a I challenge. I can't think to, of yeah. one. Um, it's possible that... It, oh, Some brute small... I feel like I've had them before, mm. and I've, I feel like I've had one or two good ones as well, but I can't off the top of my head remember. Sour and Piglets did come up. I don't think they do yeah, a Hellas, Sour and, Pig but... Sour and Piglets do really good German beers, though. Um, so if you see them in a fridge, and you feel like trying a good example of a German beer, um, yep. definitely buy it. Because um, yep. uh, Julian, the head brewer, um, was trained in Germany and he knows how to make yeah. good German beer. And they specialise in it really, don't they? It's, yeah, it's yeah absolutely. German beers are their jam. Uh, Hawkers, German pills. Okay, That's I a really good German pills. Yet. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure if they did a Hellas, they'd do a really good Hellas as well. Yes. I mean, um, they, those, those guys... Yeah. Um, no affiliation. Yes, <laughs> but, yeah. but, um, uh, with any of these. But I've, I've found that those guys, every beer that they bring out is kind of a textbook example Quite of whatever solid. style they're trying to make. Yeah. Um, so their Saison is a textbook Saison. Or, so like, um, they may not be doing like beers as exciting as say like a red skin stout like Moondog yeah, or, or crazy something like that. Kaiju sort of. Um, but the beers that they are doing are, are kind of real sort of classic examples of, of the type of beer that they're making and yeah their German Pils is, is a really good example of a German Pils mm. um, I can't though think of a, a Hellas a Hellas yeah <laughs> it really is it's hard to find a good one um, because yes, it's hard to, it's, yeah, it's it's hard to make a good it's, one it's, it, yep. it's, and, it's and probably more the, there are engineering challenges for uh, breweries to do lagers in general there's a lot of power required for cooling and um it's, it's, a, it's a different than, setup. Yeah, a different setup to that. If so if, if your brewery is set up, and most breweries in Australia are because just that's what's popular. If your brewery is set up to do hoppy ales, then making a good lager is a complete change of process from what your sort of, all your gear is set up to do, what all your brewing team is trained to do with your gear. Mm. So it's, it, it's a Logistics. very different thing. It's a, it's a yeah, it, it takes some doing yep. and I think a lot of breweries that make lagers maybe don't go through all the steps to sort of nail it down perfectly like mm. they probably cut a few corners yep. in order to achieve it and I mean they, they do some really great yep. jobs uh, yeah all right everyone I think it's break time again okay. I'm gonna do tend to some camera stuff so uh, it'll be a short break this time um, I've put a timer in the window just so you know how long you know, you, you, you have to wait till we come back. Go grab yourselves a 
I don't know, a beer or a, a non-alcoholic beverage. And um, if that's your preference, I will be right back. We is back. We is back. Yay. We is back. Um, all right. So, so, we, so I was just saying, we've just hit our second um, sugar conversion rest. Um, and I'm kind of poking my head in here periodically to have a look at the work. It is looking gorgeous, yeah. but a beautiful, super pale gold, um, which is exactly what we're kind of wanting to achieve with this sort of style of beer. Um, and I mentioned before, like there's, there's a bunch of different folks who will use more complex grain bills in this style of beer. Um, and if you do that, you will get a slightly darker color to the beer, but as long as it's within the range of kind of acceptable color, um, you're fine. So I know Jamil Zainashev, who's kind of pretty well known as, as, a, as a bit of a style guru, I think in his um, Hellas recipe, he uses Munich malt um, and a bit of uh, melanoidin as well, um, to just to boost the malt flavor up a little bit. Um, I'm actually going to be relying very heavily on the yeast um, for the malt character in my beer. Um, so another one of the big differences for me between a German Pils and a, Bav and a Munich Hellas um, is the yeast that I use. Um, so when I'm using a, when I'm brewing a German Pils, um, I use the 2124 um, Bohemian Lager yeast, which is the unofficially, that's the Y is 2124, which is unofficially the Weinstefan 3470 lager strain. Um, the most commonly used lager strain of yeast in the world, as far as I'm aware. So it gives you a really clean, really crisp, um, very dry and neutral kind of fermentation profile. So for Pilsner, perfect. Um, for German Pilsner, I should say, uh, perfect. Um, it, gives, it gives you exactly the right mouthfeel, exactly the right malt presence, um, keeps out of everything's way and then lets the hops that you put in there shine through and kind of do what they need to do. With a Bavarian beer, or with Bavarian beers generally, I think the malt flavour is really important. Um, you want the beer to dry out, which by that I mean attenuate fully, so um, you get... Um, so I'm getting itchy under this mask. I should have shaved. <laughs> <laughs> They're a um, pain, aren't they? After oh, oh, yeah. Oh. But, yeah. I've actually, I, I see that uh, Joel's done the same thing as me. I've, yeah. I've modified it with a cable tie and a lacquer band a so that it's packing. not rubbing on the back of my ears as much. But um, yeah. um, the, you want there to be lots of malt flavour but you still want it to fully attenuate. So um, ferment out as many of the available sugars as possible so that it, it ends up nice and dry and, and with the right mouthfeel. Um, and again, that comes down to what I was saying before about needing to be able to drink it by the litre in a beer garden. Um, that attenuation, that sort of fully fermented character of, of those beers is what lets you do that. So even like something like a Big Manson or even like some of the box, maybe not the box, <laughs> but definitely like a Manson um, or a, a Munich Dunkel, um, you can drink a lot of those beers um, and still be thirsty. They're very Moorish and that comes down to that fermentation profile, that, that, um, that really dry finish on them. But when you drink them, they're still full of malt flavor, like really rich, really intense flavor. But once you've swallowed the beer, it's gone. Um, so the yeast is really critical part of that. Um, so the yeast that I use in a Munich Hellas and in pretty much any Bavarian beer that I brew that isn't like a Hefeweizen, um, is the Y yeast uh, 2206, which is the Bavarian Lager yeast. Um, uh, there is another Y yeast called Munich Lager. Um, I know a lot of people swear by that yeast. Personally, I don't like it for my brewing. Um, the thing about yeast is every yeast strain is different. It has its idiosyncrasies, it has its personality. Um, and 
and it's going to act in a specific way when subjected to specific conditions. So different brewers have different approaches, like the way that you approach a recipe, the way that you approach the brewing process, the way that you approach fermentation. They're going to, in a lot of ways, be unique to you. And what you'll find is that certain yeasts are going to respond to the conditions that you provide them better than others. So a lot of people swear by the, the Munich Lager, the 2308, um, and they obviously have brewing practices which are beneficial to that yeast or, or which work well with that yeast. Personally, I don't like my beers when I ferment them with the 2308, but the 2206 is perfect for me. Um, so um, what I love about it is you get a really, really strong, rich, almost cookie, do cookie dough like um, malt character from it. Okay. So, whatever, um, I think for me, a, like a lager fermentation, it sh it's about highlighting the ingredients that went into the wort more than it is about the yeast itself. So, um, an ale yeast is kicking off all these different esters and these different spicy notes and, and characters and turns the wort into ale. It, like it, it takes all these flavors and makes it into a new thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas lager yeast, like a nice, cold, slow fermented lager yeast, it, it takes the flavors that are in there and it kind of keeps them yeah, right. um, in place. Like you, you, obviously it will be different. It's gonna be a lot less sweet because you've turned the um, sugars into alcohol, but you get the flavor of the malt that you use, you get the flavor of the hops that you use and, and you don't get much of anything else. Like it really sort of cleans up and clarifies the flavors of, of the ingredients that you've thrown in there, but they'll still have different ways of doing that. So what the 226 does is it really lets the malt shine through and, and gives it that oomph and that sort of body. And when, again, because I'm only using Pilsner malt, I need all the help I can get to beef up that malt flavor and that malt character. So by having the um, having a yeast that really amplifies and sort of um, boosts that, I get pretty much exactly where I want to be. Um, and and it, it blows my mind every time, like how just using Pilsner malt, I can get such a big malt expression. Um, and and it's, it's just that yeast, it's, it's a monster. Wow. It's just brilliant. That's a, a really good, yeah, rundown. I think a conversation on yeast is really helpful because we do get lots of questions about, especially these beers where the recipes or the ingredients on the malt side are really basic. And um, so, yeah, that, that just highlights how important and how different yeast make an impact. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. I actually learned something there. So <laughs> I'll be taking that, <laughs> taking that into uh, my brewing. Yeah, anyway. Um, there's, probably, there's probably like some pro brewer or someone that's watching is like, what is this guy talking about? He's all wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but like, I mean, like I'm talking from experience, right? Yeah. Like it, it's, no, it's like, very anecdotal. Yeah. Um, but, but, but you are the is, resident lager guy. I would... Um, I, yeah, I mostly brew yeah, right like, like... I've brewed probably three lagers for every non-lager that I've brewed. Um, so I, I kind of... There's more anecdotal... <laughs> stories about, about brewing from, from lagers for me than, than yeah. other styles. The fermentation profile that I use for making lagers um, is, I, I mean, the way that you ferment the beer is going to be really important. Um, and there's a bunch of different approaches to making lagers. Um, some people pitch warm and then drop it down. Some people pitch cold and then ramp it up. Um, there's all these different, different ways of doing it. Um, when my first lager that I made, um, I had no idea what I was doing. I pitched one smack pack of, um, of yeast into a um, probably too high gravity wort uh, and tried to ferment it out. I ended up with massive amounts of diacetyl, um, just a horrible, horrible attempt. Um, and it was so bad that I was like, I'm determined to learn how to do this properly. Um, so I like read a bunch of stuff and the first thing I read about the temperature pro um, profile of a lager fermentation, I've stuck with. And, and I've done that every time since because when I did it, it worked perfectly. I'm like, I'm not going to change that. I'm going to keep doing it that way. Um, so I pitch my lagers at seven degrees Celsius. 
um, which is cold. Um, but the reason why I do that is that things like the precursors to diacetyl um, and a lot of the other kind of common lager faults all sort of happen in that early stage of the fermentation. So the colder I can make it in the initial stages, the less of those precursors are going to get thrown off and the less I'm going to have to clean it up later. Interesting, yeah. Okay, so you pitch, and I do this too, just in general with my beers, I'll pitch a bit below the target temperature and just let it free rise. <laughs> Thing I do with 2206, which is different from other ones. So normally I'll pitch at seven, let it rise up to 10 and hold it at 10 the whole way. I find 2206 needs a bit of encouragement at the end. Um, so it'll drop down to sort of 1014, 1013, and then I'll give it an extra couple of degrees just to get it through those last few gravity points. Um, if I don't do that, it can finish a little heavy in the mouth. Um, but that's not every time. Um, and I do think it's really important um, to use your sensors with a lot of this. So take a gravity reading, use your hydrometer and measure it, but also smell it, taste it, play it by ear. If for whatever reason something has happened somewhere along the lines, some part of your process is interacting with the yeast in a certain way, um, then you want to be able to intervene with that. So um, you may find that when you use this yeast at the same temperatures that I say, for whatever reason, some part of your process has meant that you do have diastole, in which case you want to be on top of that. You want to be elevating those temperatures to let the yeast chew that up and get rid of it. Um, I think sensory analysis with lagers is really important mm. because you, you want to make sure that um, you're getting that good clean fermentation. Yeah, being objective about your beers too, trying to spot the flaw, any flaws, I guess, yeah, is, is the way to put Be it. Be proactive. being hard on yourself, you know? Just like, okay, it's, it's a proactive fermentation. Yeah. It's, it's not a set and forget. It's, it's you're engaged in the process from start to finish, yeah. which is nice. It's rewarding. Yeah, that, yeah I, I agree. Part of doing that, because it is so cold, I really make sure that I've got way more yeast than I need. Um, so when you're looking at um, your pitching rate calculators and stuff, which we haven't really spoken much about sure, on these demos yeah. before. And I, and maybe we'll do, a, when we do a yeast, at some point we'll be planning to do a yeast start a video. We may touch on that then. Yeah, um, so I won't go into too much yeah, detail now. That's just, you know, Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got the, no, yeah, it's good. Oh, just, just, just pointing out that's a map back there for anyone watching, moving the brown uh, um, Again, we are a working brew shop. Yeah, so I think that, the, the, and this is some good advice in general for yeast, especially for lagers, is over pitching is better than under pitching. Yeah. Um, just, just. There's so two amounts more. of yeast for a lager. There's enough yeast and not enough yeah. yeast. And you want to be in the enough yeast <laughs> category. It, yeah, if, there's no such thing as too much yeast. I mean, there probably is in certain circumstances, but for all intents and purposes. You're highly unlikely to um, hit that number yeah, in a um, homebrew setting. And, and for lagers, you just, yeah, you're better off just going nuts. So yeah, so I pitch a massive pitch of super healthy, super fresh yeast, seven degrees into my fermenter. You're probably seeing uh, a picture that lagers to do them well, there's, there are extra steps involved. You don't have to sort of do all the steps, but you can see how far down, you know, the sort of the yeah. The more you know. the um, more boxes you tick, yeah, in the best practice sort of notebook, the better you. I mean, in general, the better your beers sure. are going to be. But there's less leeway with a lager than there is with mm. an ale. Yeah, that's part you of you get away with less. Um, so, and particularly a pale lager like a Hellas, where there's nowhere really to hide faults. Um, you want to be ticking as many best practice boxes as you can. So well oxygenated wort, which as we said before, is now all of a sudden a point of contention. Um, but yeah, well oxygenated wort, a really strong, healthy, good pitch of the right type of yeast and 
good control of your fermentation temperatures um, is really what's going to um, look after you. And there's really only three things to do. Yeah. Um, and once you once you understand how to achieve those things, then you'll nail every yeah. single lager you do yeah. um, in terms of the fermentation. It, it, it's literally just a matter of getting those three things into your processes. Process. Yeah. And and you won't have any dramas with it. Uh, um, so I guess the only real thing we've got left to talk about is the hops. But basically, uh, I've probably mentioned before, um, with the Municalis, you want to basically use a Bavarian hop. Um, so Magnum is a good Bavarian hop. Um, you don't need to use much of that because um, it's got quite a high alpha acid percentage. Um, but um, I've heard a lot of people say with Munich Hellas that a simple 60 minute addition is plenty to get the hop, oh, there we go. Plenty to get the hop character yeah. in. I think the really crucial thing for this style of beer is using the right hops. So Magnum, as I said, is a good option. Um, if you're only gonna do a 60 minute addition. So a lot of people say one single 60 minute addition of a good German hop will give you enough flavor for this style. Personally, I like a little bit more hop flavour in it. And when I say a little bit, I mean a tiny bit. Like, you don't want a super strong hop character from this beer. Um, or else you're getting into Pilsen territory. Um, so I, for this recipe, have done one 20 gram edition of Halatau at 6.6%. Um, the amount of hops I'm adding is dependent on the alpha acids. So um, if your hops are 4% alpha acids, you might add more of them at, at that 60 minute addition in order to, to hit the bitterness level that, that I'm chasing. Um, but currently they're 6.6%, so I'm putting 20 grams in at 60 minutes. Um, and then at 10 minutes, I'm putting in 10 grams, so a really small amount, um, just to give it a slight kick of hop flavor. I think it's really sort of pleasant, to, and, and it's Halatau. It's, mm. I'm not putting in like Cascade or Citra, or yes. one of those big, punchy, citrusy, piney Yeah, continental monsters. hops are, are their, own, it's, their own thing. It's a little bit floral, a little bit spicy. Um, I think Halatau more spicy. Um, when I use Tetanang, it's more floral. So the, the, yeah. the, the, they, they kind of have their, their places that they occupy. Yeah. Um, and both are delicious in a Halas. Yeah. Um, and I really base it on how good the hops are smelling. Like that's one benefit of working in a homebrew yeah. shop is when you open a new oh, bag of hops, you yeah. stick your nose in there, this batch is really good. Yeah, not to make anyone jealous, but yeah, we were talking before the stream about this very topic, Halatau, and, and I was saying how I've come to enjoy Tetanang, and I got onto that from opening a, a bag recently and just thinking, oh, that smells pretty good. I think I have to make a beer with that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, both are awesome. Both are from the Halatau region and both have an incredible um, flavour and aroma. Um, so either is good. Um, I do probably have a particularly strong fondness for Halatau tradition mm -hmm. or middle fruit. Um, they are different hops, but they have really yes. similar characteristics. Yep. Um, it's got this slightly cinnamony kind of spiciness to it, right. which is really sort of, oh, it's hard to describe. It, it's its own thing. It really is its own thing, but it, it's just gorgeous in a beer. Um, and I want a little bit of that to come through um, in the glass. So um, I am doing a little 10 minute edition, but you could absolutely get away with doing just a 60 minute edition for Hellas. Yep. Um, with one of those hops again, yep. you want something from Bavaria, so um, yep. Halatau, Tetanang, um, Magnum, um, your Spalt and your Perla and your Northern Brewer probably wouldn't be hops that I would use in this style. Okay, um, they're a little too... It's needing something a bit more delicate, is that it's, the idea? Yeah, it's just the wrong character. Like Northern Brewer's got a real mintiness to it, which I don't think really fits. Um, and Spalt's got a real twang to it. Like it's perfect in an alt beer. 
though, something but a little I more. I feel like in this yeah. one, you want you want more of the floral or the spicy and slightly earthiness as well that you kind of get from these hops. Yep, interesting. Um, and I, I honestly, I recommend everybody as you're getting into brewing, um, try to use a bunch of different hops um, when you're getting started. <coughs> To like find excuses to use a hop you haven't used before. Good point. Open the bag and get your nose into it and give a really good smell and write down what you're smelling. And yep. then when you've got it in the beer, write down what you're tasting. Because your notes on what you smell and taste are going to make more of a connection in your brain to those smells and flavors mm. than somebody else's descriptions. Yep. It's like um, a mindful, you know, you're just sort of making those connections. And yeah, that's a good. Smash you, beers are really good for that. Yeah, you know, just absolutely. Um, but yeah, when you've palate. written it down, and this is pretty much technically a smash it's beer. True, yeah. If you, if yeah, you don't yeah, count again, the acidulated good, malt. For example. And what I could do um, in, in place of using acidulated malt is I could put um, some lactic or phosphoric acid in the mash, just like through a syringe um, to do my pH adjustments that way. Um, I use the acidulated malt mostly because I like the fact that it's in line with the Rhein Heights Gebot. So when I'm, when I'm brewing German beers, I like to kind of stick to that. Yep. Um, I think it's also pretty easy when you're using a water calculator. Um, I mean, it's easy either way, but you can just take out some of your base malt and replace it with acidulated malt and it will give you in real time kind of the, the adjustment to your, your mash um, from doing that. So. Um, But yeah, you could absolutely call this a smash beer. It's Pilsner and Hallertau. Um, and I reckon if you nail a brew like this and enter that into a smash beer comp, you will absolutely destroy yeah. the competition. Yeah. And for those who maybe aren't familiar with the term smash beer, means single malt, single hop. Yeah, that's right. Single malt, single hop. So it's just, yeah, you're just trying to get a clean expression of uh, two, two ingredients, just so you can. And lager is probably the yep. best way to get a clean expression of, of like we said earlier, it's like you get a really yeah, clean, mate. clear expression of, of the ingredients you put into the beer. So um, yeah, smash lagers, a uh, great way to learn ingredients. Because um, I think as well, getting to know the ingredients in the context of a beer is important. So I heard someone say once what they'll do is get a type of beer like maybe like Tui's, um, oh, what's what's the one, not Tui's, um, Carlton Cold. Oh, okay. Which is like, it's it's a really sort of low flavored yeah. um, kind of macro lager. Um, and they'll pop the caps off, throw a couple of pallets of, of a different type of hop in there and just reseal them. And then they can come back to it um, yeah, then they can come back to it and smell it, taste it, and they're getting that hop in the context of a beer. So it, it gives them a more accurate idea of what is going to happen if they use that in a brew. Um, and, and I've never actually tried it <laughs> to, to do it, but it makes a lot of sense. And when, when you do like um, in BJCP or in the Cicerone um, training that they do, when you're doing doctored beer tastings, it usually is a beer like cut and cold or um, yeah right just a very i mean not to super it, low flavor just, beer yeah. so you'll have a glass of your control which is just the beer with nothing added and then they'll add the different additives in there um so you can see the difference between the beer with and the beer without um and yeah it, it can be a fun thing to do yeah well, i mean that's one good thing about lower gravity ones like hallis is um you don't have to lager them for quite as long for them to be good and hallis sure. actually is a lager that is better fresh. Um, okay. So okay. you obviously still want to lager it. Um, yep. I'd, I'd sort of say as a general rule with lagers, give it a month um, cold and every 10 points over 1040 it goes, add a week to that. So oh. 1050, I'd maybe five weeks, 1060, six weeks, 1070, seven weeks. And Got the good it. thing about that is the number corresponds with the um, Gravity. gravity. Well. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it, that, that's sort of my general rule for, um, for lagering times. Um, and and you, okay. I okay, tend cool. to find that that's a, that's a, works well for me. But yeah, yeah definitely Munich Hellas, um, once that four weeks is up, well, mm. once it's kind of at its, at its point, 
drink it fresh. Um, yep. And you'll get that nice, gentle sort of hop flavor from that late, slightly later hop addition. You'll get the the clarity of all the flavors. You'll get you like all the all the things that you sort of want out of it will be, will be there. Um, over time, it will sort of become a bit muted. Yep. Um, yep. So good point because I have often wondered that my about that myself. The extended lagering with beers that have that delicate hop flavor. You're going, you're trading off the lagering process with at the potentially the cost of those hot yeah. flavors. Oh, I mean, it's exactly fading. the same with Pilsner. Um, even possibly mm. more so with Pilsner. Um, I always thought Pilsner was a boring, bland, mm -hmm. crappy style until I had uh, Budweiser Budvar from a can instead of a bottle. So we had um, we had a can and a bottle next to each other. The can was a later packaging date than the bottle. But I, we opened the bottle, had a taste. Yep, that's how I understand Pilsner to be. Open the can and without even pouring it into the glass, got mm. hit with a wave mm -hmm. of floral SARS and was just like, what? <laughs> and and it just, I, I brewed my first Pilsner that weekend. Um, and it, it, yeah, it really does make a difference with those um, European lagers, the pale ones, the more kind of um, delicate ones, mm. having them a little bit fresher. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's pretty much um, Munich Alice covered, really. Basically, what's going to happen now is this will boil for about an hour. Yeah. 10 minutes to go, the machine was going to beep at me. I'll throw in the rest of the hops. Um, I've got some yeast nutrient and some brew bright there, which is going to um, help fine out and clear the any of the protein that does kick up in the beer. Um, it'll help clear that out. And yeah, there's, there's not much else that's, that's going to happen from this point on. Yeah, there. so pretty much from here, it's just a, a boil, a late hop additions that he's got over there. There's a bit of findings to chuck in, but again, we've We'll probably cover, if we haven't covered this in videos already, there'll be more coming out. And then there's cubing. And uh, as we said, there's a, a cubing video out there. I will pop a link, hang on, that side up there. There'll be a link eventually to that. For anyone who's interested, yeah, cool. Yeah. Otherwise, thanks for hanging out. That's yeah. just, I've had fun yeah. today. Yeah, I had fun. Uh, thanks for all the, all the <laughs> chat and the, and the comments. You've all been really good today. I think, yeah, I think the more active the chat is, the, the kind of... I, I really appreciate this format because it, you get that kind of opportunity to have a conversation. It's not yeah. just like blasting you with prepared information. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, and it is, you know, in these weird times where we're all self-isolating and uh, we would love to be able to do the live demos with the crowd. Um, uh, obviously, that's not possible at the moment. So this is a really good format, you know, to get feedback and engagement with our community. That's all we're trying to do is help people make better. Beer. If you guys have something you'd like to see us do a stream about as well, um, yep. suggestions, drop a comment, shoot comments. us an email, um, let us know, and we can kind of uh, work on that too. Uh, so our pleasure, everyone. I hope there was um, information in there you found useful and um, entertaining. Um, just a bit of business, do all the like, subscribing stuff that helps our channel grow. Um, Make uh, sure you, you hit know, that bell rolling. notification. Know, smash that subscribe button. Yeah. Uh, do it, don't do it, but yeah, it, it, <laughs> it helps us out. It's been fun. Thank you very much, everyone. And stay safe. Uh, and yes. um, yeah, stay safe and, and, and be well. Okay, bye bye. Hey, Joel and Ben here. You just watched an episode of Second Runnings, an edited version of our longer live streams. If you are interested in catching one of those live streams, you can click the link to our website. Uh, we will have the full schedule of upcoming streams uh, there, so you can catch them and join in, get into the chat. <laughs>